I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsor for this session, Cooperators. As a one-stop financial services provider, Cooperators offers the advice and solutions you need to keep what matters safe and to save for what matters. I've really been looking forward to this summit through all of our planning and work to convene you all for these important conversations, conversations that will contribute to the development of Canada's purpose economy. Yesterday, during his opening keynote, former Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi named an important observation that progress is always the result of collaborations, of networks, of diverse groups of people, organizations, sectors, and governments that together create the progress from which society benefits. As Coro pointed out yesterday, and as others have echoed, we stand at a powerful moment in history. Multiple major crises are impacting our economy. The climate emergency that has severely impacted many of my fellow British Columbians this week, the COVID pandemic that of course has impacted us all, an opioid crisis, and a housing and affordability crisis that may be exacerbated by rising inflation. What will it take for us to unite the many diverse actors we will need to bring together to help us complete a shift to a purpose-based economy? Business, of course, has an outsized role to play in societal health, in social justice, and in supporting our collective well-being. Workforces and customers are encouraging, even pressuring employers People, after all, want to work for good companies and buy from values-aligned businesses. So how should businesses respond? How should other sectors of the economy respond? To consider these questions, I'm joined by a remarkable panel. I've very much been looking forward to the conversation we'll have today. Each of my four guests has made significant contributions to similar ecosystem-based approaches to change. The Honorable Hassan Youssef is one of Canada's most experienced labor leaders and the first person of color to lead Canada's union movement. He served two terms as the president of the Canadian Labor Congress. He's also an, um, he has also the past president of the Trade Union Confederation of the Americas, an international organization that represents more than 55 million workers in 21 countries. Mr. Youssef has received numerous leadership awards as well as honorary doctorates from two universities, and he was named to the Canadian Senate by Prime Minister Trudeau. Alison Hewitt is the Vice President of Impact at the Mars Discovery District in Toronto, where she has been working on advancing sectors to work together to do good better. She spent 10 years leading SIG at Mars, or Social Innovation Generation, which helped create a culture of social innovation in Canada. And she is currently leading the development of a Business for Purpose network, advancing business as a force for good by putting purpose at the core of their work. Amy Sergas is with the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. She was most recently Manager Innovation, Growth and Capital, but will be joining the ministry's small business branch as Manager of Programs. Amy thrives in developing collaborative program partnerships among industry, nonprofits and government. She's been dedicated to building regional services, support organizations and systems for innovative startups and entrepreneurs for over 15 years. And finally, Chad Park is the Vice President of Sustainability and Citizenship for the Cooperators, where he leads the cooperative's efforts to embed and integrate sustainability principles throughout the organization and oversees its nationwide community investment and partnership programs. Prior to joining the Cooperators, Chad was founding director and lead animator for the Energy Futures Lab, where he helped build a broad coalition of innovators and influencers collaborating on energy transition in the province of Alberta. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being part of this, Canada's first summit on the purpose economy. Really grateful to have you here. Thank you, Mike. Um, I thought I'd like to begin by asking each of you just to give us a brief history of your work in the ecosystems where you have been contributing. What did you do or what are you doing to create an enabling ecosystem for your sector or issue? And I'd like first to go to, uh, to Hassan. Tell us a little bit about your work in the labor movement. Well, uh, thanks very much, Mike. And uh, first of all, it's an honor to join uh, colleagues and friends uh, from afar here in Ottawa this morning. But equally, uh, let me first start off and acknowledge the incredible challenges that our fellow citizens are struggling in BC right now. And of course, our hearts and our best wishes are going out to them. Hopefully, we'll get through this. And of course, uh, we'll do what we need to ensure we can get through this. Um, in regards to 
the subject matter, I'll just touch on one areas that I've done some work most recently. And that is, and of course, the uh, uh, the government commitment to phase out coal generation as part of our commitment to long term climate objective. Um, of course, uh, co chairing this task force meant we had to go to communities, we had to talk to workers, we had to talk to employers, and we had to talk to governments, all who had a role to play in regard to achieving this great objective. And of course, um, when I agreed to do it, I was naive to think it was going to be easy. Of course, uh, once we were down the path, having to go to those communities to have this conversation, it was extremely uh, challenging, but also necessary. And for two reasons. One, of course, we were talking to individual workers whose jobs were going to disappear from the coal generation coming to an end. And of course, we were talking to, of course, workers who were mining the coal that that would no longer be possible for them to do that work. And these are workers who are making anywhere between 60 to $100,000 a year. And of course, trying to figure out how can we then, of course, support those workers and the community as they will transition to ensure we were not burning this type of material anymore, of course, to create electricity. Uh, of course, it was much to learn. Um, we had to go to Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, also New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And each region of the country, of course, the challenges is different. And more importantly, of course, um, how are we going to achieve this objective? Of course, I can say without any hesitation. The final, of course, uh, report of the task force was unanimous for all those who were serving on it. We weren't arguing with each other as to whether or not we should recommend these things to government. But equally, we wanted to ensure we were doing justice to the voices we heard across the four provinces and to the workers in the community to ensure, of course, government would follow up on the necessary program to support them going forward. As a union leader, uh, one of the reasons I took on this response was to ensure we had a role to play in the climate crisis in this country. We can't sit back and, of course, tell employers and government, you must do this. We have a responsibility to lead by example. And more importantly, we've got an obligation to talk to our members in an intelligent way to ensure they understood equally they also have some response. As difficult as it is for them to lose their job, what can they be doing in the future? Of course, these things are never easy. They're always difficult. But more importantly, I think as a country, as we go through this climate challenge we're dealing with, there will be disruption to many different types of work in this country going forward. But at the same time, we can do things to ensure workers and community can see a different path forward for us to meet our climate objective. At the same time, doing the things that are necessary, of course, to protect human health, to create good employment for the future, and of course, to bring build strong environment communities across the country. Well, it's uh, it's fascinating to hear you connect the um, the labor movement to the climate crisis. It's such a such an important consideration, particularly when you take that very human centered approach that you do, um, putting people's lives and well being first as we think about the the challenges of the disruption and the transition that lies ahead of us. Um, I'm, I'm reminded with that human centered approach of the importance of that in the work of of social innovation and your work at SIG, Allison. I wonder if you could pick up from there and just share a little bit about the social innovation ecosystem in Canada. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. So thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm here to share some of the lessons of SIG. It was a 10 year long initiative to create a culture of social innovation in Canada. So I'm gonna to try to give you 10 lessons in our, in our short period of time, I hope it works. So SIG came about when McConnell approached Mars to say, we love what you're doing with social innovation and that we propose you integrate social innovation into your work to create something uniquely Canadian. So together we approached the province of Ontario to fund this work and we created Social Innovation Generation or SIG with me leading SIG at Mars in 2007. So SIG was a national collaborative of the McConnell Foundation based in Montreal, PLAN led by Alec Mansky from BC, Al, probably known to many of you, a social entrepreneur with a focus on persons with disabilities, Professor Francis Wesley, who's our thought leader in social innovation based at the University of Waterloo, and Mars with our focus on supporting social entrepreneurs. So first lesson, secure the support of visionary funders and leaders and bring them along as partners so you can learn together. Despite having a shared goal, we found it really hard to work together with these different institutions, different cultures and different accountabilities. So we ended up hiring Tim Drayman to run SIG National and help us figure out how the sum was greater than the whole of the parts. We focused on social finance. So if you're gonna work across sectors, 
this is the lesson number two, make sure you have someone whose job it is to manage the complexities of the relationship and find something you can work on together. So in 2007, we held the first social finance forum at Mars. And in 2010, we launched the Canadian Task Force on Social Finance with luminaries such as former Prime Minister and former Finance Minister Paul Martin, philanthropic leaders like McConnell, and business leaders like Tamara Vrooman from Van City. We made seven and only seven recommendations, one of which was the creation of a social finance fund. Lesson three, if you're gonna create a task force, secure people at the highest level you can from across the relevant sectors and focus your recommendations to give people a sense of the possible. Lesson four, it is important to have an institutional home for systems change work. In this case, we created the Center for Impact Investing at Mars. It created a focal point for the movement. And if it has a physical presence like Mars, all the better. Yesterday, we heard from Minister Karina Gohl that Canada now has an $805 million social finance fund. So if you did the math, that only took a little over 10 years, but we got it. So lessons five will not be a surprise. Systems change takes a long time. Lesson six, document and help accelerate the process for others. And it helps really create the space for critical reflection and feedback. So I'm hoping you can see this book if I hold it up that we wrote, it's available online and it captures our learnings from 10 years of SIG. We had many wins, right? We, we created many educational offerings, both within academia, but in more informal settings like the Getting to Maybe residences at the Banff Center. Amy took that program. A social entrepreneurship curriculum is offered in many faculties across the country. Um, Merrick, my colleague, graduated with an MBA from Memorial in social entrepreneurship. Lesson seven, engagement of youth in academia matters to create the next generation of systems change leaders and secure the research and rigor that validates your work. We brought many social innovations to Canada, the School for Social Entrepreneurs from the UK, Social Innovation Labs from Denmark, B Corps from the US. We helped uh, secure through certification the very first B Corp in Canada. And we hosted the B Lab, the B Lab Canada, like that whole Mars thing for many years at Mars with Joy Sue, who'll be speaking later today as the first employee. And we also organized a UK study tour, connections which are still relevant today. So lesson eight is while Canada is unique with our own culture and geography, we can and we must learn from others. To act with others is to lead with hubris and we don't have enough time to make all the mistakes. We have to learn from others. So we also worked with government, co-created the social innovation and the social finance strategy that you heard about yesterday. We created the capacity building program in a week to help nonprofits move from social innovation theory to practice. So lesson nine, work with the various sectors to determine what is important to them and work alongside them to develop new programs and services. It's about meeting people where they're at. And finally, I would say we had a lot of failures. Social innovation is hard, but if we weren't failing, we weren't doing our job. We had to experiment, we had to learn, and we had to pivot. So lesson 10, create safe spaces to work with others and experiment. Mars was founded on the concept of divergent thinkers working together to get to convergent action. But we believe it is the only way forward to tackle our most complex issues. And later on, we'll discuss what we would have done differently, but hopefully those lessons were helpful for us as we figure out what we're doing in this movement. Wow, fantastic to rattle through 10 lessons in such a short period. I'm so glad this is being recorded. Uh, this is my fingers can't keep up with the notes. A couple of things really stood out for me, though, that your emphasis in a couple of ways on cross sectoral engagement and activation across sectors and across regions and, and so on. That, that inclusiveness is a pretty remarkable takeaway for me. Also, the power of focus, as you said, to give people a sense of the possible. I really appreciated that and sort of lift our gaze to the possibility rather than the constraints. And then, of course, change takes time. Um, but as I turn to Amy, technology sort of promises dramatic change and quick change. Uh, you've spent a lot of years in the technology sector doing this similar sort of ecosystem based work. Uh, what share us a little bit about uh, your history and your work? 
Thanks, Mike, and thanks everyone for be for the opportunity here. I'm super excited to share. Um, similar to Allison, our initiatives had a lot of parallels, both from a time and place perspective. I think we started our uh, regional innovation ecosystem initiatives at about the same time um, at Mars with Allison. I'll just jump to the present for a moment. Um, at the last few years uh, at the Ontario Ministry of Economic Development, job creation and trade have been focused on some of our uh, innovation ecosystem programs in the emerging technology space. So it's kind of um, or different funding programs and tools used to support various emergent technologies or accelerate the commercialization process for science-based founders and ensure that these innovations can kind of see the light of day in the marketplace. Um, we do that through um, a key organization, the Ontario Center of Innovation, um, through our venture capital ecosystem, um, through our, our venture capital agency, the Ontario Capital Growth Corporation, as well as other funds that we support, like at Mars, the Investment Accelerator Fund. And then uh, through through in, um, the actual investments in tech infrastructure, like artificial intelligence at Vector, 5G, um, and next generation networks, um, which is a multi-stakeholder, multi-partner, industry partner initiative. Next week, I'm going to be moving to the small business area. So um, post-pandemic, um, quite enthusiastic about how do we do this for our small business community in light of recovery and in our current climate. Um, so in all these ways, our ministry acts as you know, a funding partner primarily, but also as a tool to coordinate all of these multiple partners and establish models for accountability so that we can better understand our impact and address barriers. Um, back in time though, I spent a bit of time at Mars. Um, our initiative, or my time in the initiative ran about 10 years as well. And the problem at the time was that we were looking, the Ontario government was looking to shift um, focus onto an innovation economy and how do we, we modernize our traditional industries. And one way of doing that was to create sort of a fresh start system of business programs and supports to create these lasting technology companies. Um, and there were sort of a smattering of commercialization based or support organizations out there, but nothing unified or cohesive. So we started by building supports um, and putting them out there, putting mentors and entrepreneurs and residents in place in regional um, communities, connecting them through education and tools. And this was all sort of at the time where tech was kind of happening, this, these sorts of initiatives were kind of happening in the States, but what we didn't realize is that we were building sort of a virtual accelerator across the, the province of Ontario and connecting in regional innovation resources to any community so that if an entrepreneur pops up and they're a med tech entrepreneur in Sudbury, there's a way to provide that access to them. So. Fast forward to today, there's a formalized network of 17 organizations. They're entrenched in their regional economic development mandates and work collaboratively you know, across Ontario and with the government to um, continue to chip away at that big problem of the innovation economy. We're not there yet, but what we have seen is a lot more um, tech-based entrepreneurs and just a, a baseline of understanding and a level set that's out there um, that you can really create innovation anywhere and connect them to the right people and resources. Fabulous. It's so easy to think of, of government as just the funder, but you make this beautiful point that um, the convening power of government, your ability to coordinate across vast groups and, and great difference and, and of course, great regions, uh, sheer scale of Canada, that convening power is really, really important. Um, but you mentioned another piece as well, models for accountability was a phrase that you used. And I think that's that's really important. You know, it's so easy to, to convene and have these delicious conversations, uh, but it's actually the activation of the potential in these convenings and these groups of people that, that makes the change happen. Uh, I was pretty struck by the notion of entrepreneurs in residence in regional communities as well. A really, really neat idea to sort of create those centers of, of capacity and that sort of the virtual accelerator, as you named it. 
Um, of course, we have a pretty intensive regional effort in the province of Alberta, and, the, and I'll turn to Chad, the Energy Futures Lab work, to think about what a just transition looks like in, in that province and in the, the oil and gas sector. Um, would love to hear your reflections on that work, Chad, but also the work that you're doing now at Cooperators in, in working toward change in the finance space. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I should start by uh, just mentioning the cooperators work, um, um, but I will elaborate more on the Energy Futures Lab work. I mean, um, of course, when we're talking about ecosystems, we're ultimately talking about collaboration or cooperation. And um, so it's really in uh, our organization's name and in its sort of DNA as a, as a cooperative and really is a purpose-driven organization. And they've, you know, the organization has a, has a track record of having um, kind of put the issue in the middle and convened um, progress around several issues, whether it's flood insurance uh, in the past or um, mental health or um, or work we're doing now on youth employment and, and a program called Pathways to Employability. Um, but uh, I will, the, the most direct answer I have to the question here is actually more from the Energy Futures Lab experience that I had um, as the founding director and lead animator there. And um, I was a student of Allison and SIGs in many ways. And um, uh, I, I, she had 10 lessons. I've only managed to accumulate four. Uh, so, um, you know, someday maybe I'll get up to 10. But um, this, the, you mentioned the Energy Futures Lab as a, as a social innovation lab um, focused on energy transition in the province. You can imagine, um, you know, the, the, the challenges there. Um, it was interesting, we did a round of, of interviews with um, sector leaders from a whole range of sectors before we formed the Energy Futures Lab. And there were so many things that people disagreed on, um, but there was one thing that everyone actually agreed on. Um, and that was that uh, polarization on these issues was a problem. So no matter what, what perspective um, people were coming from, polarization on the issue was actually making it hard to to get anything done whatever the that um that thing was that uh, we, you were trying to get done so um we kind of turned that into an opportunity um by putting the polarization in the center of the convening and so that leads to my my first point i guess which is um something we did consciously and i would say did well at the start was in how we framed the invitation to uh, what we didn't know then was called, you know, was an, an ecosystem, but really became an ecosystem. Um, we framed the invitation in an, as an inclusive way as possible. It wouldn't have worked to have said, even in the name, that this was the clean energy lab. Um, it wouldn't have worked to, in the invitation, to talk about, um, let's focus on, um, uh, you know, on even using the word transition at that time, uh, five, six years ago. Um, so Energy Futures Lab, the convening question was how can we leverage Alberta's strengths in energy um, to help accelerate the transition to the energy system that the future requires of us? And that statement about the energy system that the future requires of us was, was inherently begging uh, a discussion about what is the energy system that the future requires of us. Um, so just the way that that was framed really made it possible for us to get the broadest array of stakeholders possible uh, involved in the effort um, because uh, we really needed them if we were going to try to make some some progress on these issues. Um, so scope was a, there was always pressure to scope it more narrowly. Uh, like let's focus on the oil sands or let's focus on the electricity system or something like that. We always kind of resisted that uh, in, in, in this case because um, the scale of the challenge, if we're talking about polarization, if we're talking about progress on energy transition, really required a broader systems view. And as soon as we would have narrowed the, the scope uh, too too much, <clears throat> we would have um, we would have missed the opportunity to foster that broader collaboration. So that was a big one. The next one was around the model we used. We used a fellowship model. Um, so there are dozens of organizations, but also the core of the collaboration of the ecosystem was this group of about 40 or 50 fellows, uh, at some points up to even 70. And these, a couple of things, I know that model has been used elsewhere. A couple of things that were distinct for us were, um, or, or, you know, we made conscious choices as well. One was about the level of the people involved. So we weren't 
always the most senior people, um, although in some cases in smaller organizations, there were executive directors and CEOs and so on. Um, but what they were was uh, rising stars, uh, you know, people on a leadership track. And that was a conscious choice that this is going to take time as we're talking about ul ultimately about culture shift. Wanna we want to target people that are on a leadership track that are going to be, you know, working on these issues for a decade or more. Um, and, and, and lastly on that, we deliberately recruited them as individuals, not as representatives from their organizations. And that was really important to tap into the individual sense of purpose that people had about these issues. Um, they, they were not showing up at the table as the representative of XYZ organization, even though ultimately they could draw on that. Um, but in the way that it was framed, um, in, you know, the, and, and, and the way the collaboration was, was cultivated, it was really about kind of tapping into that deeper sense of purpose that the individuals have on the issues. And then when they transitioned jobs and, and so on, they stayed in the fellowship, it didn't matter. Um, and I think that was a, was a good choice we made. Um, the third point is just about how we convened. And I think there, the key point is just about the authenticity of the convening and um and and you know the it relates to the point i just made about individuals but um but it was really about um the style of uh, the tone and the and the personal relationships that were built in in the convening and that you know as it as it grew it, you know it broadened out it was you know it's more it's more than just what you can do in one room now it's a it's a much broader ecosystem um, but always that that style of convening, I think that that was really critical, and and, um, and part of that is my last one, which is the uh, um, Allison referred to uh, learning by failing, and um, or, or you know I I think we if there was one secret sauce with the Energy Futures Lab, it was probably our um, our the capacity we built or the muscle we built around developmental evaluation. But learning and adapting as we went, um, and that means in how we how we did everything. That means in the transparency that we um, that we displayed to our to our um, participants in the network, so that you know here's the impact, here's the feedback you gave, here's how we've adjusted things based on that feedback. That sort of constant process of adapt adaptation and yes, learning from failures as well. So um, those are some of the key lessons from the Energy Futures Lab from my perspective. Yeah, amazing. I mean, there's, a, there's so much that you say that really resonates for me, the complexity of these kinds of systems work and these ecosystem based efforts require us to evaluate our progress along the way and adapt, right? Because what we think is going to work at the outset may turn out to be a good solution or may not. And we need to change tack and, and figure out different ways to engage. And I also I, I'm fascinated with the, the naming and framing that you did around Energy Futures Lab just to purposefully to create this very inclusive um, effort um, to convene across difference um, to sort of reject the polarization and try to have everybody in the room for healthy conversations is something very human about that that feels really really appealing um, a couple of you have mentioned that uh, you know mistakes were made along the way um, so I'm, I'm curious for a couple of things I'd love to go back to Hassan and then hear again from each of you what's one thing that you're most proud of and if you were going to go back, what's one thing you wish you'd do differently, had done differently? Well, um, it's always a, a challenge to reflect on, um, you know, the process that you followed. But um, I think what I'm most proud of in terms of the work we did on the coal task force is what remained the ongoing, I think, legacy of that work. Um, subsequent, of course, um, to the task force, uh, Canada, along with the UK, created uh, the Powering Pass Coal a Coalition, which is a global coalition around the world, as to how we can phase out coal and leading by example, showing our experience of how we kind of got there. Recognizing also, I think, in this process is that, um, you know, what we did was unique to Canadian reality and experience and communities across the country. Others may have to follow a different path. But the one thing I think I would reflect on that we could, um, to do differently is how do you bring the group and keep them together after you finish this very incredible work? Because the reality is, is that um, people need to still counsel um, communities and provinces as to how we continue to move forward in this uh, direction. 
And by not having the ability to do that, uh, I think um, it, it, in my view, uh, there was a sense of weakness because people's experience can inform as they will work through to 2030 as we continue to phase out, hopefully by that date or shortly after our, our use of coal and coal generation. Uh, the leadership that is required to continue to hold um, um, folks together to find common path forward is going to be a challenge because it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're disrupting so much of the economic activity and, of course, um, uh, people's uh, job. The um, I think the, the lasting legacy, I think, also, too, in this work is that, um, which was um, Chad was just talking about um, sometime, I'm hoping, if not this year, maybe uh, in the new year, the government will introduce, finally introduce a just transition legislation, which will give some meaning to some of the underpinnings that how the federal government can play a political role in working with province and workers that are going to face these challenges going forward. Incredible news. Thank you. How about you, Allison? If there's one thing you're most proud of or and, and one thing that you might reflect on that you would do differently if you had it to do over again? Yeah, so lots of things for sure. I mean, the fund is great that's exciting it, it took a really long time to build that capacity but 805 million in the ecosystem for that is fantastic but i would say probably most proud of having the opportunity to work with social entrepreneurs you know in the early days i remember talking to people and, and saying i think you're a social entrepreneur they're like you know like the v8 commercial people who hit themselves on the head like there are other people making money and making a social impact i thought i was crazy and you know it was really quite divided so giving people a sense of community and helping them make both more money and more impact has been pretty damn lucky to have had that opportunity. So that's what I feel probably the most proud of. Um, in terms of what we did differently, so you heard a lot about what SIG did with nonprofits and governments and academia. We didn't do so great with the corporate community. We had a couple of engagements, but not the way we wanted. And we've all talked about cross-sectoral collaboration. So I've been watching really carefully what's been happening in, you know, the traditional CSR field and how that language is not used that much anymore, sustainability, ESG, et cetera. And then was really, really thrilled to see the introduction of purpose and seeing leaders, you know, from Unilever, we heard Gary yesterday and, and others, obviously Paul Pullman, and there's so many leaders, Mark Benioff from Salesforce is great. And they're, they're putting the purpose of their business at the core of what, what their work is all about. And I thought, okay, we're onto something here. We're onto something. And so created this business for purpose concept um, with uh, McConnell, and then went out and found very cool people working on this. Of course, Coro and Mary Ellen, incredible leadership, and folks like CBSR, you know, you heard from Lior yesterday, and Canadian Center for the Purpose of the Corporation. So many of us, and as you referenced, we have this really big country, but we're a really small population. We need to think like a system and we need to do better here. So creating a platform and enabling platform for others to get together. And I know, Mike, you were one of my first subscribers to the Business for Purpose weekly announcement and right. you contributed to it. And, and that's fantastic. That's what we need. We need people to sign up for the weekly announcement and share. And, you know, so we don't have to continue to make each other's mistakes. That would be my big goal. So. Right. Yeah, and the other lesson I take from that is is sharing the lessons, sharing the practices, not getting competitive about ideas, but it's cooperating and learning together. And that's what movement building looks like. All right, is that back to cooperators, uh, Chad? Maybe I'll just take that as a, a cue to you and come back to you, Amy. I've just used the word cooperation. What what if you look back, Chad? What are you most proud of, and what might you change as you look at, if you look back? Um, I'm most proud of the um, the people that we um, brought together and and the um, the community that was built so maybe similarly to to um, to, to what Allison was just saying I mean at this point now um, there's almost I was gonna say weekly but it's almost daily where there's something in the news um, whether it's um, Alberta Innovates releasing their bitumen beyond combustion paper and program last week, or the federal and provincial governments announcing a hydrogen strategy, or um, you know major solar power investments in southern Alberta, and so on. There's almost uh, um, there are so many things that are being um, brought much more into the public um, realm that have their roots um, in the Energy Futures Lab and the network that was built, and many of those players that are now on those big stages are 
some of the original or ongoing partners of the lab. And so to me, that's the greatest source of pride is seeing that the platform that we helped create um, has helped elevate their um, profile and their work and, uh, and largely out of the public eye. Like, I mean, there's not too many people who actually have even heard of the Energy Futures Lab, but for the people who have been involved in it, they, they, they know the, the key role that the network and the ecosystem has played. Um, so yeah, definitely that um, the the community and in terms of thing to do better, there's a really long list here, um, but uh, I'll just pick one. Um, well, I, I think the the one I'll I'll pick actually relates to the theme of truth and reconciliation, and um, the uh, we right from the start with the Energy Futures Lab, we had a um, I, I'm going to I'm going to say like a, a good or even noble intention to um, to be very inclusive of um, of indigenous peoples in the in the process um, to look at um, issues for uh, you know indigenous uh, issues being faced by indigenous communities and so on. Um, we weren't always clear, especially at the start, how we were going to you know fulfill that um, that that um, intention. Um, and I would say there we had some some significant false starts um, that we later rectified through the developmental evaluation process. But one in particular was putting too much burden on the few representatives we had in the network and the ecosystem who were representing indigenous um, communities and perspectives and so on. We, and by burden, I mean, um, you know, it's and this is, I'm sure, a very common story that everyone could have, uh, you know, everyone who has these kind of experiences could have could have told us uh, it would go this way. But just because there were, let's say, out of forty, there were four or five maybe indigenous fellows, the the room and the conveners and so on would always look to those few individuals to provide wisdom and insight from from an indigenous lens, an indigenous perspective, and it's a lot to. It's a lot of responsibility in a in a collective effort to rest on the shoulders of a few people. So we learned along the way that our work on truth and reconciliation had to be not just about creating the inclusive um, means of engaging um, with with those individuals and communities, but but to um, to do the work ourselves uh, of truth and reconciliation and and to really deepen our own uh, as conveners. I mean our own. Um, understanding of the issues. We're thrilled to be able to partner with the BAMP Center to do, do a customized version of their right relations course um, for our network, for our team and so on, and just to build from there. So that truth and reconciliation became just a lens of how we did everything instead of, um, you know, a, a piece of the program right. and a piece of the network. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a but really it, it was learned. It was learned in, in great difficulty. Right. Yeah, it's, it's hard work, uh, but it's, as you know, really, really important work if we're truly going to be inclusive and embracing a different worldview, whether an Indigenous worldview or faith-based worldviews or others, it's really, really important yeah. work if we're going to bridge these differences, right? Thanks for sharing that. Um, Amy, to you, what uh, as you look back, what are you most proud of over a, a great legacy of work? What are you most proud of and what would you do differently? Yeah, I think I'd uh, go back to the regional connectivity piece again. Mm -hmm. It really allowed us to avoid creating a one-size-fits-all model. Um, the approach could have been generate some tech-related programs at Mars and be Mars soldiers and go across the land and deliver, <laughs> deliver that um, to each community. And we chose the harder route and built it from within each community and kept connected that back into a central area. So it taught us a lot about the flexibility needed and what, what you're trying to provide, but also the different um, kinds of companies that are out there. So innovation looks a little bit different in Sault Ste. Marie, perhaps, than in downtown Toronto. Um, and so we were stronger together as a collaborative network and a community of practice as a result of that, I think. Um, on the what we would have done differently, I have a few of those. And, you know, um, Chad's words sort of reminded me about um, when we first started out 
what our mentors and entrepreneurs and residents looked like and where they came from. And um, because of the nascency of our tech community, a lot of our mentors and entrepreneurs and residents were um, white older guys from telco and or from you know other and that was the industry and that was the industry that spurred our experts on and so that um you know didn't go well at first and slowly we're able to chip away at creating a bit more diversity or at least um bringing visibility to that as a, as an issue and what we were hearing from our clients where women or people of color or indigenous entrepreneurs maybe didn't feel welcome at these places because they didn't see themselves in them. Um, I think the other piece of what we would have done differently is, and now and this is purely coming from a, a government bias now being inside the government is understanding what your exit plan might look like in the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, Allison and group did a great job with social innovation generation to, um, you know, create your initiative and then exit the initiative. Um, I know the work is never done, but when you're working on, especially government funded cycles, it's important to have a line of sight um, like the people will change, everything will change as you go throughout the process. And so understanding what, you know, are you out of this initiative in three, six, nine years, and then creating the resources around that that are appropriate um, and build a bit more resiliency so that when the actors change and when the leadership changes and maybe when the government changes, you have a bit more um, teeth in place. Um, with your initiative, or at least, you know, from a government funded perspective, because the policy of today might not be the policy of tomorrow. So it helps to maybe entrench a little and um, lock down an, <laughs> the initiative so that there's a bit more of a sticky factor in the ecosystem. Right. Yeah, this is something really interesting in that. This, this is something that there that correlates to me with the, the notion of, um, letting a thousand flowers bloom right if we're if we're truly creating ecosystem change then it needs to take root in the ecosystem it can't be led by one organization uh, so this notion of time specific time bound projects social innovation generation was a 10-year project well-being economy alliance is framed as a 10-year project and then these rhythms of government really give us these these time limited periods to plant a thousand flowers and let a thousand flowers bloom right and that's what that's what ecosystem work looks like Really, really valuable reminder. Um, I want to look at some of the audience questions. There's a few that have come into the chat. Uh, Hannah Hill notes that I'm seeing a theme here. People are at the core. Uh, so another reinforcement of this really human-centered approach that each of you has spoken about. Um, but I'll go to, to Vanya Tautzik's uh, question first. She says, I'd love to learn more about the challenges of how to approach those on the polarized end with kindness and patience, especially when there's a sense of urgency needed to move this work forward. So I'm keen for anybody's reflections, but I wonder if you could uh, share a little bit more, Chad, because that came up as, as you were talking about the Energy Futures Lab. Yeah, um, this is a big topic for a couple of mm -hmm. minutes. Um, first of all, I'll say um, one has to be realistic. And by that, I mean, uh, I, I can't believe it's me saying that, but anyway, um, we didn't start the Energy Futures Lab with the expectation that we were going to get Ezra Levant and David Suzuki to um, come together and find some common ground. Um, so it was, um, you know, I think we, the starting point, it was, is sort of cast the net as consciously like we did as widely as possible and inclusively as possible. But I think probably accept that we're not necessarily um, going to, to at, at first anyway, um, get the most extreme ends of those polarized debates. Um, at least that was my experience anyway. Um, but having said that, um, when you create some momentum, like a, I think of it like a spiral, um, you know, you can start to draw in others when 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 you know you are finding ground with people with or helping people with diverse opinions find common ground and a good example of that um in the energy futures lab was actually was written up in the global mail one time was um there were two or sorry in corporate nights there were there were two um 
um, of the original fellows, one who is the leader of a geothermal company, one who is a, a CEO of a midstream gas company. Um, and uh, you, you, you honestly could not come with two people who are most more, more different in their worldview and their um, you know priorities and so on. And for two years, they would you know they would probably describe each other as being the kind of personification as of or, or, of what's wrong with the the system. You know, like um, uh, n not that they were antagonistic to each other. I mean, but I just mean that they were just not. They they never, they wouldn't find collaboration and so on. But there there was a a moment in the process where having been a part of and worked on things collectively together and therefore shared some sense of a group success, um, like mm -hmm. the development of an early yeah. of a vision uh, of the whole group that everyone could agree on, or you know some sort of collective achievements that they were each a part of in some maybe small or big way, th that created the grounds for for uh you know maybe more fertile conversations and it got uh there was a moment where you know the 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 one um realized that the other needed office space and um and and well, the other one had office space and and sure enough you know a, a half a year later or less than that even they're literally cohabitated their two companies together and wow. and finding collaborative projects together so that that you know we would not have started with the intention that that could happen um, uh, or the expectation that, that could happen. It, it really is about this, the cultivation of the ecosystem, having individ, you know, giving, giving time for these kind of respectful relationships to evolve and creating the conditions for them to. And, um, and, um, you know, and, and, and really, uh, uh, I guess just, you know, um, creating a shared sense of, achievement that it can be the grounds for more individual collaboration yeah I, I really appreciate that that spiral image that you gave us right start with the common ground and get the conversation energized and moving and it will draw in the people from the from the extremes mm -hmm. really really useful uh, notion um, Hassan, I, I, I reflect on um, so many conversations that we see in the media and stories about the company versus the union and the sort of two extremes coming together and, and having a rough time at the bargaining table. It seems to me that there's a polarity there that's, that's probably false in many, many cases where unions and companies work very well together. But I'm curious if you have some reflections on how you bring these polarities together or bring them into a conversation. Well, quite often what we see in the media is not reality. What we see in the media is a moment of drama. And when it's happened, it looks as real as possible. But the reality is uh, when bargaining is done, normally when it's completed, uh, folks actually spend a lot of time building relationship because the success of that enterprise is critical to the employment of their members. So it's not always um, what you see you should believe. I think it's fundamental to understand people have very deep entrenched relationship and they work on a lot of things in a collaborative way because it's about the greater good that both sides needs to achieve in regard to the success of the company but too often or not we tend to focus on that one minute uh, microcosm of the relationship which gets magnified in the media you know these parties are going at it and we uh, define i'll give you a quick example at uh, way back um, maybe a decade and a half, we did a survey asking Canadians in general what they thought about the labor movement. And there were two things that came very clearly in the survey. We were always on strike and two, we we're always protesting. We do protest from time to time and we do go on strike from time to time. But the reality is, is that um, we asked this question of people in Manitoba. And the year in which the survey was done, there was not a single strike in Manitoba, but people thought we we're always on strike. <laughs> is that you know one particular image kind of represent the movement for quite a long time so i i often say to folks that um when we're given a moment to speak in the media we have to remember who the audience is that we're speaking to we're not talking to our members we're talking to the public we need to communicate in a way for the public to understand first of all what is this about and more importantly why should they care or should they be supportive of it and more often than not, because we're focused on the needs of the members, uh, we forget the fact that we've got to build public support equally for our, our cause and for the effort. And more importantly, the members need to appreciate, you know, not what the union leader may say publicly, 
may please the members because they want to hear a little bit more spice in, in the conversation. And I said, well, that doesn't help. That may help in the back rooms or in a meeting, but it doesn't help publicly for us to do that. And I think this, of course, is as, uh, um, an effort for us to learn. But also, I think you know, from a labor movement perspective, given we're in so many facets of life and society, we also have to recognize the greater good that we do and how do we tell that story about all the other things we do, yes. which have nothing to do with protest or strike. It has to do with about what kind of a society do we want to live in? How do we play a role in help shaping that society as ongoing? And more importantly, it's critical that union leaders, when they talk publicly, not about their self-interest, about the greater good uh, that is happening, and more importantly, the role that they can play in help shaping that debate, but equally, uh, you know, uh, get their members to appreciate that they have a role in, do, in, in doing something about that, rather than sitting on the sidelines watching the show. And the climate change is... Uh, one of my focus lately is that this is upon us. We don't have the luxury of hiding or pretending, and it's not going to go away. And more importantly, we can either come together as a society and figure this out, because we can, or we can continue to be polarizing and divided. And by the way, the climate crisis is not going to go away. It's going to be in front of us, and decisions are going to be made. And more importantly, uh, they're going to impact whether it's businesses or province or workers or communities, and we need to take those into consideration. If we want to shape the debate in a positive way, not everything we're going to do are going to be shared upon, but the reality is some of it is necessary if you want to get to that greater good that you want to do. Facing out coal is the right thing for us to do as a society, as a country, because one, is bad for human health, it's bad for the environment, it's bad for climate. But of course, lots of people work in generating coal electricity. They mine coal, they, they get paid very well. And, and if you're gonna tell somebody, they have to give up their livelihood and move their family from their community. I think that come with a bit of understanding. What are you talking about? I went to those communities that are impacted and I had large gatherings in those communities where six, seven hundred people showed up to have a conversation. Uh, I think it will um, certainly be a special place in my heart forever because I recognize the ambivalence, the worry, the challenges that people mm. are thinking about. Children and families, okay, where are we going to live? Where are we going to work? And I think public policy can only be informed and better shaped by understanding that publicly. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned six or 700 people coming to these gatherings, and we heard Mayor Nenshi yesterday saying that most people want to be involved in these big societal conversations, but they don't know how. Uh, and of course, there's another subset of our population that is marginalized, that don't get included in these conversations. And my friend Joanna butchkowska McCumber has put a, a question in the chat here. Um, working in the ecosystem is so key. How do we ensure that the voices that have been historically excluded are involved in designing the ecosystem of the future across sectors such as youth, BIPOC individuals, LGBTQIA plus communities? Uh, and on point, I'd like to go to the two women on the panel to, to take this question. Either of you might feel compelled to go first. Yeah, I'm happy to, to kick it off. I, I would say two things. You need to create a, a platform uh, where this can happen and you need to allow for self-organization so you can't have a everything needs to go through this particular point that doesn't make any sense but you also need to be incredibly intentional so um, recently I was for the business for purpose network I was approached by someone who runs an organization called Setsi which is focused on traditional social enterprise but engagement of marginalized populations in particular black professionals and he'd never thought about working more with the traditional business sector. And so we're coming together now to figure out how do we work together? How do we build his skill set and the skill set of the people in the Business for Purpose Network to figure this out? So create an enabling environment, enable it to happen, get out of the way in some places, but where you can, and I think this is something that's really critical, be intentional, find resources, because we can't say, well, the mainstream's got the resources, marginalized folks are gonna, we want to work with them, but not give them any resources. And that doesn't make any sense to me. So make sure that there's, as we say in social innovation, resource flows to appropriate areas of energy so that people can contribute in the mm -hmm. way that they need to. So those are a couple of ideas. Right, resource flows to appropriate areas of energy. I appreciate that. Amy, what reflections might you have on this question mm -hmm. about bringing in those that are typically marginalized? Yeah, I'd echo all <laughs> the things that mm. I've been said, but also going to the places and spaces um, and, and getting back to that intention. So, 
you know, th that intentional outreach to, to support organizations and maybe grassroots initiatives. And, and I think these are easier to find more on a community level. Um, so, so digging into your communities a little bit deeper um, and better understanding what your reach is and what the perspectives are. Um, you know, I, I think it sometimes only takes like the one or two people or the glimmer of, of yeah, we have a connection to, to turn into um, something greater. So I think really, really going out there and, and reaching out to, to similar minded organizations that are directly working in those spaces. So whether those are LGBTQIA support organizations or um, supporting uh, ind indigenous centers, um, other places, you can find these places where people gather and convene. Yeah, I love that. Reach out. Don't don't wait for folks to come to you or uh, that may not have the resources to do so. Reach out, go to them, and uh, engage in that spirit of curiosity. Be there to be there to learn. Be there to engage. Be there to be in conversation and in right relationship. Right. So so powerful. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I'd love to hear from each of you as a, as a closing comment here. What what would you recommend as you look at this social purpose ecosystem work, as we think about the ecosystem work to bring about a social purpose economy? What might be one recommendation each of you would have? Um, perhaps I'll go back to uh, Senator Yusuf. Well, I think uh, uh, the one I would suggest is uh, you have to prepare to collaborate with others. Uh, this ain't going to happen simply by pretending that you got all the answers and more importantly, you're going to solve the problem. You have to work with others um, and more importantly, prepare to listen, to learn new things. Um, I learn new things every day. Uh, so it's not it's not that difficult that I think that um, the change that uh, I think society are expecting of how business operate and, and conduct themselves um, is not something they're going to allow to go back to the way it was. I think it's the evolution of history, but it's also an evolution of, um, I think, consumers and individuals and citizens uh, way of saying, I, I want to see corporations behave differently. And if they don't, uh, if I have an opportunity to patronize them, I'll choose to go someplace else and patronize mm -hmm. the business where my values are more aligned with how they conduct themselves. Right on a regular basis. I just think that um, the world is changing and it's changing at a rapid rate and we don't get to control conversations anymore. The internet right. is all of that. And given that that's the new reality, I think we also have to inform ourselves uh, in the context of our role and responsibility, how can we be better at what we do? And and, and of course, uh, learn um, uh, from others at the same time and be, be, be prepared to, you know, to, uh, to give a little bit of yourself, to not think you have all the answers to how we can solve these questions. Right. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you one recommendation for this ecosystem? So last night, for people who stuck around, we had a lot of fun. They had a, a DJ and there was games. And here's my my lesson about social change. It's freaking hard. You better find people you like to work with and have some fun while you're doing it. Right, because you're in it for the long haul. So really approach, like life is short. We know we've, we've all been through stuff and, and that would be my recommendation. That's lovely. I appreciate it. Amy Sergas, how about you? Um, I guess it's thinking about growth and we're all trying to grow the ecosystem. And if we're successful, we're going to continue to grow. So for me, it's more about staying relevant and staying responsive to the needs um, that are out there and listening. The space is going to evolve you, around you. So you're, you might be the only game in town at first, but very quickly you won't be. And so understanding how you continue to support and fit um, on a longer term basis and adapt to, to what's around you and maybe understand what your role is not and what it can, can kind of mm. continue to be. Great insight. Understand what your role is not. Know when to say no and share with others. Yeah. Chad Park, uh, last recommendation from you. Um. I love, I love Allison's there. It, it, it brought back memories of uh, mechanical bull riding and so on. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the, I, I think my, my um, maybe more, more sort of practitioner answer would be um, to focus on, on developmental evaluation and, and to really sort of learn, learn and adapt just to really develop that that muscle as a as a collaborative or as a network, uh, and be be really conscious about it. Um, 
one of the first things I did when I joined the cooperators last year was invite um, Mark Cabage, uh, expert in developmental evaluation, in to do some work with our team and with the board of the cooperators community funds because uh, I think that mindset of social innovation and of continuous improvement and experimentation and so on is just is just vital to um, to being able to 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 work through all the ups and downs. Uh, like like what um, Allison was talking about. So, but the other thing on a personal level, I would say for any of us involved in this is um, something that uh, a very uh, wise colleague of mine once told the story uh, to me uh, about, which is um, um, someone was asked, what's the single uh, most important quality of, of leadership, especially in a collaborative space. And her response was, um, the ability to give people the benefit of the doubt, mm. and I thought, you know, just if we hearken back to the the um, the polarization part or other parts, I I, I found that so profound um, because I really think sometimes we show up in these contexts with uh, with of course with a deep sense of purpose, and we're frustrated if others don't share our deep sense of purpose, and um, uh, and so um, I, I really think it's helpful to to assume that most people want to do good and, um, you know, to um, uh, contribute positively and so on. And so it's sometimes it's just a matter of kind of nurturing the, the mm -hmm. relationship until you find the, the seed where you can, you can yeah. find some common ground and work together. Beautiful, beautiful. Open collaboration, maintain the fun, stay relevant and responsive, and always listen, learn, and assume others' positive intent. Those are fantastic lessons and recommendations. Uh, I want to thank this amazing panel for a, an inspiring conversation and for being with us during this Propelling Purpose Summit. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I was so looking forward to it, and it, uh, it absolutely did not disappoint. So grateful to be in conversation with each of you and all of you. Uh, I'm going to hand us back now to our moderator for today, Coro Strandberg, who's going to provide us with an overview of the Purpose Economy Roadmap of Canada, a picture of the ecosystem. So Coro, back to you. I need to make my background just a little fancier than the one you can see right there. Uh huh. That's called a green screen, in case you're wondering. I can panelists. I I had a great image of that mechanical bull, and then maybe when we meet next in person, which I hope will be in a couple of years, uh, we can bring one on stream chat, and you can show us how to ride the darn thing. Um, but your panelists, you opened up a number of pathways that we can pursue uh, for business to become a greater force for good. Uh, and uh, all the panelists now, you could uh, turn off your uh, video and your camera. And I'm now going to provide an overview, as Mike has said, of the Canadian Purpose Economy Roadmap. As I do, please make notes of what you would like to add to these initiatives to share in the upcoming breakout. I'm really going to go through them quite quickly. This is version 1.1.0, we call it. And at the end of today, we want to work with you to get this to version 2.0. So we want your thoughts. So please make notes as I go through of uh, um, actions and possibilities and leverage points that you would like to see us include. But first, uh, to recall our definition of social purpose business is a company whose enduring reason for being is to create a better world. And the definition of the purpose economy that we have been using is an economy powered by the pursuit of long-term well-being for all in which business and regulatory and financial systems foster an equitable, flourishing, resilient future. So those are the definitions we are using for the upcoming uh, discussions. And these are the levers that we identified at uh, the Globe Forum a year and a half ago um, uh, where there was a consultation on what were the levers of change to accelerate social purpose in business. Corporate leadership, post-secondary education, the role of associations, creating an enabling ecosystem, the panel we were just talking about, public policy, and social purpose procurement. Uh, so when we uh, met up, we were looking at what was the aspirational future state by 2030. And in the case of corporate leadership, our aspirational state that we had in mind was that companies would formalize their social purpose and evaluate their performance against it with investors holding them to account. 
and that the actions would be to engage investors and boards and others in oversight and pursuit of an authentic social purpose. Two tools we've released at this summit, a governance framework for purpose oversight and the social purpose assessment tool, which we'll be releasing later on today. The second leverage point is post-secondary education. And the vision we had in mind was that business students would learn about social purpose business models and that business related exec ed programs would include social purpose. And the action we identified was to engage business schools to provide social purpose education. And uh, yesterday we released a scan of business school social purpose education, which is still somewhat in its infancy. And I somehow did I? I think I clicked out of my slides, so somebody could uh, repost my slides, and I'm going to keep going um, on that. Okay, so here we are. I think I just did post-secondary education. There we go now. And so in the with respect to the Trade and Professional Association lever, our vision was that associations would advance social purpose through their membership. And the actions we identified were, were to engage associations in advancing social purpose through their memberships and building capacity programs. And also that associations might in the future uh, engage in the creation of an association social purpose certification program. And yesterday we released a social purpose association framework, uh, which is the first step on the path to all of the above. Uh, on the matter of ecosystem enablement, we identified that Canada would be in the future would benefit from a flourishing and well-resourced social purpose ecosystem with government incentives, intermediary capacity building support, academic research, education, et cetera. And so far, the, uh, the action we identified back then was to map and engage the ecosystem to create an enabling environment. And our key achievement so far is that we have over 60 organizations that have joined the Canadian Corporate Social Purpose Ecosystem Map. And arguably, this summit was a route to advancing the social purpose ecosystem. The uh, next uh, leverage point that we identified is, I'm just trying to see if I can advance the slide this way, was public policy where uh, we had in mind uh, that by 2030, all governments would build and accelerate the Canadian purpose economy. And that in fact, the Canadian model would be replicated in other jurisdictions. Uh, for our actions, we identified to raise awareness of the purpose economy and its benefits with government and advocate that governments accelerate social, play a role to accelerate authentic social purpose in business. And we have a number of government representatives attending the summit for which we're very excited to, to have them involved. Our key achievement was to create a purpose policy options uh, paper, uh, which we are uh, releasing uh, in our session this afternoon. And we are also working on the creation of a local government purpose activation model with the city of Burnaby and a big shout out to the city of Burnaby representatives who are joining us today that's in, in development. And then um, we identified uh, this last lever which is uh, social purpose procurement, which is that most Canadian organizations would procure their goods and services from social purpose companies. The action here that we identified was to provide education to pro procurement managers on how to incorporate social purpose into procurement where they're already incorporating environmental um, uh, factors and um, social sourcing factors and other kinds of factors we're suggesting uh, that uh, procurement managers also look at how they can start to promote and raise awareness of social purpose with their supply chain and our key achievement there was a social purpose procurement toolkit which we um, issued yesterday so as you can see we have a number of um, leverage points that we've identified and the slides can be taken down now and uh, hopefully uh, this has given you a sense as to where we are today and how far we've come and we're now going to go into breakout groups where we will ask you to brainstorm actions you'd like to see to build the social purpose ecosystem in Canada. Uh, 